Hello, this is Matt Brown, and I'm coming at you with another video on IoT hacking related content. Uh, I want to thank everyone who watched my first video and commented on it, shared your feedback. I uh, really appreciate all that. Uh, today, I'm going to be coming at you with the first part of a three part video series on Bluetooth low energy hacking. I actually got the opportunity to speak at a conference in my home state of Iowa called CornCon recently, and my talk didn't get recorded. It just happened to be in a room that wasn't getting recorded, so I thought I would record it in a three-part series and put it up on YouTube for you all to see. So with that being said, I'm going to jump into our first part of the video. So, um, so obviously, uh, this is me. Don't really need to go over much of this. Uh, yeah, I love hacking on stuff. Uh, I'm from Iowa State. And uh, yeah, my day job, I pen test IoT systems. If you happen to need a pen test, uh, give me a ring. So first of all, why did I do a talk on Bluetooth or Bluetooth Low Energy? Uh, has that been talked to death? Uh, is, that, is it relevant? all that. So uh, Bluetooth is not going anywhere. Uh, the market share uh, is steadily increasing uh, over years and it's projected as you can see. Uh, you can take these numbers with, with a grain of salt because they are from uh, Bluetooth themselves but uh, probably everyone would agree with these numbers that the number of Bluetooth devices is going to keep increasing due to uh, its wide support in an array of devices. So this graph I thought was specifically interesting because it is forecasting the amount of devices at that top sliver. Uh, this is what Bluetooth is predicting for devices that ship only with a low energy radio in them. So uh, some devices just support Bluetooth Classic. We're going to get into the differences between those two uh, protocols in a little bit. Uh, and then there are devices such as your smartphone, your laptop, things like that, that support both. Uh, and then there are devices, little smart things, that only are ever going to use the low power uh, portion of the Bluetooth protocol and therefore only implement that low energy radio. And so that's a really interesting part of this graph and that is some warrant for us to uh, dig in and learn a little bit more about Bluetooth low energy security. So uh, obviously the use of Bluetooth low energy in the Internet of Things has exploded. Uh, you can think of any type of object out there and there's probably a startup in Silicon Valley that has slapped a Bluetooth stack onto that thing and bingo, there's their, there's their company idea. So uh, you got locks, lights, all sorts of fun home automation stuff. And then you have more serious type of devices, uh, medical devices, glucose monitors, blood, blood pressure monitors, things of that nature that uh, have a little bit more sensitive data that they're collecting. These, all these devices are using Bluetooth low energy uh, due to uh, a number of factors, which we will talk about. So what is Bluetooth? And then specifically, what is Bluetooth low energy? So, Bluetooth is a short-range wireless protocol. It operates on the 2.4 gigahertz uh, frequency range. So this is the same as your 2.4 uh, gigahertz Wi-Fi. It shares that same uh, radio space. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, kind of also your microwave. If your microwave is leaking and it doesn't have, it's not shielded properly, that can cause interference on 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, fun fact. Uh, Bluetooth is a frequency hopping spread spectrum protocol, which means unlike Wi-Fi, which has a concept of channels, it breaks up its its uh, bandwidth into channels, and then it stays on that channel. Once an access point starts transmitting, it's going to stay on that one channel forever. Uh, Bluetooth does not do that. Bluetooth uses its whole frequency space and hops through that frequency space, which provides some reliability increases in Bluetooth's case, and also some challenges if you're trying to sniff Bluetooth, with which we will get into in part two. Uh, so 
Bluetooth, why? Why is it so ubiquitous? Well, it doesn't consume as much power as Wi-Fi or other high data rate protocols. Uh, and so that is a huge driving factor in why it's being used in Internet of Things devices is it just doesn't consume as much power as Wi-Fi does. And it is also widely supported in every mobile device that's being made out there. It supports Bluetooth and your laptop computer and your probably your desktop computer as well. If, you're, if your computer has a Wi-Fi card in it, it probably has Bluetooth just built into that same piece of silicon. Uh, not even the same Wi-Fi card. It's probably baked into the same piece of silicon as your Wi-Fi card. So it has support all across the range of devices it needs to. And Bluetooth is split into two protocols, classic and low energy. Uh, so what are those two protocols? What are the differences? So Bluetooth Classic came first. Uh, it wasn't originally called Bluetooth Classic, but now we call it Bluetooth Classic. This is a higher power consumption uh, protocol. And it can max out at uh, three megabits per second. Um, it obviously has those, you know, different different modes it can operate in. It splits up its frequency range into 80 channels, and its main use cases are things like data transfer and audio streaming. Uh, so your today your you know your your air your your AirPods your uh, like if you're trying to do a data transfer from a phone to a computer or something like that over Bluetooth, it's probably using classic. Also, if you're like pairing your phone with your car, most likely that's uh, using the classic protocol uh, as well as a number of our other things here and there. But what is Bluetooth Low Energy? Bluetooth Low Energy, obviously, because of the name, it consumes less power than the classic protocol. Uh, which is a very attractive thing to IoT manufacturers who are trying to run on very low power. Uh, it has a wide range of uh, data rates, but you can see on the high end, it's actually approaching Bluetooth Classic. So at some point, that it may even be as fast as Bluetooth Classic with all the developments that have been put into Bluetooth low energy. Low, low energy. Uh, so in Bluetooth low energy, we see the channel space is broken up into 40 channels, and three of those channels are advertising channels. This will be very important later when we want to sniff Bluetooth traffic. And then the other remaining 37 channels are just the data channels that a normal data transmission occurs on. So what is, are the use cases that Bluetooth Low Energy would support? So you can see it also supports data transfer. It's just not gonna be able to do it as fast as the highest data rate of Bluetooth Classic, but it can do data transfer, absolutely. It's also uh, very useful for location services, device networking, and uh, in the future, it has plans to do audio streaming. So you'll notice that all of the features that Classic supports Bluetooth Low Energy either supports it, maybe just not in as fast of a way, uh, or it has plans to support that feature in the future. Uh, and in fact, most of the major updates to the Bluetooth specif specification in recent times have been updates to the low energy side of that protocol. So what does a typical Bluetooth low energy system architecture look like? Uh, this is just a example diagram here. Uh, some of them can differ, but generally speaking, your mobile phone is going to be the gateway uh, for that smart thing to connect to the internet, to, to communicate with the rest of the world, because it cannot directly communicate with the internet uh, if it's just Bluetooth based and not Wi-Fi based. Uh, so in Bluetooth low energy, we have these names so we call the the item that is going to make a bluetooth connection to a device the central device and it connects to a peripheral device so we see those labeled there in the diagram and everything else in blue is kind of our standard architecture that 
we have some mobile API server that's going to support the mobile application and communicating that data back and being stored in some kind of a database, which then potentially can optionally be accessed via a web application as if, if you want to interact with this device in a different way and that data. So uh, how do devices advertise themselves to the world? So a peripheral device, so a smart device like this heart rate monitor that I'm wearing, it will advertise to the world on one of those three advertising channels. It'll say, hey, I want to connect and it will even give some general data about itself to the world. It will actually identify before anyone is connected to it that it is that it provides a heart rate service on this device. So when a central device, a mobile phone, wants to connect to that peripheral device, it will scan on those three advertising channels to discover what devices are out there in the world. And then the central device will initiate a connection to that peripheral device. Once a connection has been made, then how do we how do we like how do we exchange data back and forth? So if you've done any work in uh, the web API space, if you're familiar with APIs, you can think of these things called characteristics in Bluetooth as APIs. Uh, each characteristic is given a unique uh, UUID, and that UUID, that characteristic, has various uh, sets of permissions associated with them. Some of them that are really common to know, read, write, those are pretty self-explanatory. Notify, which is a, a polling mechanism where instead of reading every second, the, the, the central device reading from the peripheral every second, it can say, hey, I want you to notify me when this value changes. So those are some uh, important permissions. There's other ones as well. Uh, and these characteristics can be enumerated by a central device that knows nothing about the peripheral device. So this is really useful for pen testing. So here you can see a image from the NRF Connect application. This application is uh, supported in the app stores on both Android and iOS, surprisingly enough. And once we've connected to the device, we can see a number of these generic access service services, generic attribute services, and there's a heart rate service right there. That device shows us that at that UUID, we can interact with that service to obtain heart rate data. We, we didn't reverse engineer anything on a mobile application. It just told us that over the air uh, with no authentication, by the way. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So this is the typical Bluetooth low energy stack. Uh, we're not going to really dig too deep into this, but we're just going to hit some of the highlights. So starting from the bottom of this stack and moving up, obviously at the physical layer, you've got, you know, radio waves being converted into ones and zeros. Uh, we're not going to discuss how that takes place because that is even over my head. Uh, I don't care. So the link layer, which is one layer above that, is where it has the concept of MAC addresses, same concept as in, you know, Wi-Fi or Ethernet. Every uh, Bluetooth device is identified by a MAC address. Uh, and then link the link layer is also where optionally encryption happens in Bluetooth Low Energy. In I did say optional because it is not a required part of the Bluetooth Low Energy protocol to uh, have encryption enabled. So right above that link layer, we have this host controller interface. So this, as you, as the name implies, this is this interface that sits in between the controller that is usually implemented by the Bluetooth chip on a system and the host, which is implemented by the kernel, the, the operating system in some way. It, it's providing these other services to us. So, a really interesting thing about this host controller interface is that we can capture packets here on Android and iOS devices and 
it happens before the encryption. If, if you're using native Bluetooth encryption that happens on that link layer below, we can capture packets before they get encrypted. So even if encryption is happening, we can see what's inside that data, which is very useful if we're trying to reverse engineer a Bluetooth device. Uh, and then as we go up from there into the host and application layer, we are not going to dig into those because what's way better than trying to understand those protocols in an academic sense, uh, I learn way better through looking at things in Wireshark and understanding uh, network protocols in Wireshark. So that's what we'll do in our next video. So we need to talk about encryption because I mentioned I mentioned encryption, I mentioned it's optional. Uh, by default, all Bluetooth Low Energy communications are not encrypted and they're not authenticated. As we saw that image from that NRF Connect app earlier, that connection was made it just saw the device out there, it connected to it. The, the peripheral device device allowed that connection to take place. It at no point required the central device to authenticate itself and in no point in that whole connection was encryption happening. So, uh, but just because that, but just because Bluetooth encryption is not being used, it doesn't mean that uh, an app is implementing some sort of custom encryption that they are manually applying to the data but before they hand it to the application layer of the Bluetooth stack. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. Uh, just because you find a device that doesn't require encryption, it doesn't mean that the data going over there is actually in plain text. So, uh, encryption and pairing in Bluetooth are synonymous. They are the same thing. Because when a, a device pairs with another device, it is initiating a key exchange between those two, devi two devices. Uh, and in Bluetooth Low Energy, there are two pairing methods, two key exchange methods that are supported. Uh, there is the legacy pairing protocol and the secure pairing pro protocol. And as you can guess, if at some point, one of the pairing methods becomes called legacy, you know it has to be really bad. And it is. So, Bluetooth Low Energy legacy pairing, it uses a custom key exchange protocol. Bluetooth, instead of implementing a industry tried and tested method for key exchange, decided to create something out of whole cloth and what they get is a protocol that can be cracked in about a second with like laptop with a laptop. Uh, you can go to that GitHub link and it has the proof of concept. You just give it a PCAP file and it will attempt to decrypt it if it is using legacy pairing. And then uh, as of Bluetooth 4.2, Bluetooth got wise to <laughs> that this was obviously a really bad method of pairing and they implemented elliptic curve Diffie Hellman. Uh, base key exchange, which uh, solved most of the problems. There's still a possible active man in the middle attack at the first pairing. If, if, if you can man in the middle at the pairing process, you could theoretically uh, compromise those the, the keys and compromise the integrity of uh, the connection, the encryption, but it's very hard to do and that secure pairing really closes the door for a lot of attacks that were possible with the legacy pairing. So that brings us to the end of part one. In part two, we are going to, to discuss how to obtain Bluetooth uh, packet captures, how to sniff Bluetooth over the wire and also on devices. And then in part three, we're going to dis discuss how to write a client in using various software that will reach out and start interacting and start reaching out and touching Bluetooth devices and trying to interact with those various services. So please stay tuned for those other videos. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you for watching and have a good day.